My name is John. I'm a software engineer with about 10 years of experience. I'd like to help you become a better programmer and land your next software engineering job. In today's video, we're talking about search. Search is the single most important programmer skill. Before you write a single line of a Turing complete programming language, you need to know how to search so that you can identify the right places to learn from in the first place. So that when you run into an error, you can quickly overcome and resolve those errors. And so that you can apply your programming skill in some useful way. For example, deploying a project to some service or identifying the next job opportunity that you'd like to apply to. We're gonna cover four high-level search techniques, including prompt engineering, working with large language models like Claude 2 in front of us. Secondly, traditional search engine operation, including keyword-based search, Boolean operators, advanced site operators, a skill set that's sometimes just called Googling. Third, we're going to cover identifying and referencing trusted sources. And fourth, we will cover social learning. Before we dive in, make sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, and share the video with a friend who may be interested. Also consider Latterly.io, which will include a checklist step-by-step -step to help you learn to program and land a programming role. I recommend that you start your searches with an AI-assisted language-based tool, specifically Claude or ChatGPT. Here's a comparison of Claude 2 and GPT-4. I recommend you only use GPT-4. I do not recommend that you use GPT-3.5. Claude has better performance than GPT 3.5. Claude is also free and has a more recent knowledge cutoff. In general, you should always prefer Claude 2 to chat GPT version 3.5. GPT 4, particularly when using the code interpreter, has a much more advanced logical capability and it's precise with syntax. The main problem with Claude 2 is that it does make syntax errors, so it's not ideal for coding tasks and it does have lower logical comprehension compared to GPT-4. So I recommend that you use GPT-4 with the code interpreter by default for code or syntax sensitive questions. And for general questions, I would prefer Claude 2. GPT-4 plugins can be used to some extent to solve the knowledge cutoff. Those plugins are currently often slow so that you may as well go to Google yourself and that might be higher performance than asking GPT-4 web plugin to browse for you. Some plugins are useful for niche cases. Consider using a Finder plugin like Pluginpedia to help you search across the available plugins and find one which matches your feature requirement. On the topic of AI tools that I recommend for coding, check out GitHub Copilot and Cursor IDE for IDE tools. Claude and GPT-4 will be useful when you leave your IDE and come to the browser. The main reason that I recommend you start with a chat tool is because you may not know the right keyword to search for in a traditional search engine operation setting. You can speak to a large language model in your ordinary language, and it will be able to identify and even tell you the correct technical keywords. So that even if you would like to do a keyword search, it's a good practice to have a chat with a chat model and ask it about the right keywords to use. So we are going to ask Claude and GPT to tell us about Boolean search with Google. But before we do that, let me demonstrate a few high quality prompt engineering practices. Leave a comment in the description if you'd like an entire deep dive on many prompt engineering practices for the purpose of this video, we're going to keep it short and only do three. So the first technique will be role task. Large language models are built on a wide training set of data. Some of those training data are from expert sources, some are not. By asking the chat tool to adopt a role, we can wait the model to give us answers that would come from expert sources instead of the general population, thus improving results. You can see here that I'd like to ask Claude that I'd like to learn to code. I don't know the role to tell it to take, so I'm asking it to tell me the role. So Claude has told us that there are these three kinds of people that might give good advice about learning to code, software developers, bootcamp instructors, and professors. You can now see that we have constructed a role task prompt. I'm asking the model to play the role of an observer and summarize the advice given by these three people. So here Claude has provided the perspectives of those three individuals. I'm now gonna execute two additional prompting techniques. One is called chain of thought, the other is called reflection. Chain of thought basically means I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Reflection means I'm going to ask it to consider what it just said and improve on it. Think about you're having a conversation with a person and you ask them to think twice. This is the act of reflection. The single prompt that I'm giving causes it to do both. I say combine the advice from these three individuals into specific steps that I should take to get started. And if there's a particularly useful website, mention that. And here we get a perfectly concrete and useful answer. I think at Latterly, we do a slightly better job of encouraging you to go beyond JavaScript into TypeScript and React and become a full stack developer in the TypeScript ecosystem. Here, Claude is encouraging you to become 
a full stack developer across two languages, Python and JavaScript. These are both great options. I do stand by a single language is gonna be easier for you to learn, but you could do a lot worse than the advice that Claude just gave us with a few prompts. Let's now transition into Boolean and advanced search operator techniques with a traditional search engine like Google. By default, if I search the words coding in Python for Google, Google will execute an or search. It will search for any sites that have the keywords coding or Python. I can force it to look for both by using the keyword and. Now you can see the search result has both. The first several operators and or the double quotes, the hyphen, as well as the wildcard are widely recognized search operators that will be supported on other sites besides Google, which support Boolean search. The other operators like site, end title, end URL, and others are strictly speaking not Boolean search operators. They are advanced search operators that are supported in Google. They are site-specific operators, and other sites may have other site-specific operators. As you look for your next programming role, Indeed is an example of a site that also supports Boolean search, and notice that the Boolean search is implemented in a different way. Here I searched for JavaScript in the United States and found over 40,000 jobs. I now search for JavaScript React, and I would expect an OR operation if I'm expecting behavior consistent with Google, but notice that the number of results decreased by a factor of four. That is because Indeed is applying an AND Boolean operation behind the scenes. This time I've entered JavaScript and React under with at least one of these words, within 25 miles of the United States, find jobs, and you can see that the search syntax Indeed prepared for me is a different syntax than Google would have done, and yet the Boolean search operates as I expect. Let's continue to the third search technique, consulting a trusted source. There are five ways that I'm gonna suggest you can identify a trusted source. The first way is just by asking a language model about trusted sources. The second way will be if you encounter a programming error, often the programming error string will include a link to some website, or it will be identified with a library or programming language that has some official source. For example, if I run into an error using React.js, the React.js website is the official source and the trusted source for that library. Traffic and reputation are the next two techniques to identify trusted sources. An example of using traffic would be the Alexa website traffic metrics, or here on YouTube, I can simply look at a video view count. On Udemy, I can look at the number of reviews. That would be an indicator of traffic, but we want to consider traffic in conjunction with reputation. Consider, for example, this complete Python course with a rating of 3.8 and about 5,000 reviews. You might prefer a course that has a rating of 4.8, even if it only has 2,000 reviews, because you care about both the quality as well as the volume. We can also identify the traffic and reputation to library search to establish a trusted library. Here I've searched for social login and I've just picked a few. Let's take a look at the weekly downloads for this, for this second one, and then for this third one, I think it's pretty clear which is the least trusted, and that would be this one with the only three weekly downloads. We can also apply trusted source analysis to question and answer sites like Stack Overflow. Highly upvoted answers coming from sources with lots of reputation indicates that it's probably a more helpful question and a more helpful answer. The fifth and final way to identify a trusted source is over time accumulating your own personally known and trusted list of sources you may have ran into an obscure source that nonetheless provided a high quality answer. And over time, you may notice that certain sources, even with low traffic, little known sources, nonetheless provide really high quality answers. And you can just make a mental log and trust these places. Here are a few that I trust. One would be CSS Tricks, Mozilla, and W3 Schools. Let's do a recap. The five ways to identify a trusted source listed on screen here. Now let's talk about social learning, which is the fourth and final search topic we'll be covering today. The question is, who do you talk to and what do you say? Etiquette is important here. You wanna make sure that you're building bridges, not burning them. And there are many beneficial spillover effects over and above getting an answer to your current question. If you do a good job here, this can end up facilitating your job search and building long-term relationships. There are three answers to the question of who to ask. The first is people in your personal network. You may have a friend from high school, someone in your LinkedIn network or a coworker. The second answer to who to ask is communities around learning. Here we are in the open source Latterly Slides Learning Curriculum Repository. There's an endorsed communities document. 
I encourage you to reach out to any of these communities and there are additional tips within the document itself about how to interact with these communities. Finally, there are dedicated sites like Stack Overflow and Reddit, which are Q&A sites. You can simply ask the question there. Five bits of etiquette when working with humans. One is make sure you do a bit of work on your own first. Don't just ask for a handout, show that you've given an effort, communicate your overall goal, communicate clearly what you have tried and why it didn't work, and then invite help. A second bit of common etiquette is don't just say, hey. When you reach out with a direct message, don't just say, hey, that is a time waster. Include your question in context within the initial message. This is a common professional practice. There's a funny site, nohello.net, with some additional detail. The third piece of advice is don't spam. What exactly constitutes spam will vary by community and by personal relationship. A common rule of thumb for online communities is that bumping the message once a day is fine. In the case of personal relationships, practice some empathy and awareness. Try to understand how much stress and work is on the other person's plate at the moment, and don't bug them too much if they have a lot going on. Conversely, if they seem extremely interested and they don't have much going on that day, maybe you can have a chat back and forth with many, many messages. Fourth, follow whatever guidelines that community dictates. It's very common for discords and Reddit communities and so forth to have their own set of guidelines. And fifth, this is fairly universal, make sure to give a big loud thank you, including naming names. Thanks, Sarah, thanks, Jim, and give back when those communities are helpful to you. Expressing thanks is not just a matter of professional courtesy. You will build bridges that will be mutually beneficial well beyond the particular problem context that you're in. It will often end up spilling over into professional networking opportunities and things you can't even imagine. Once again, if you got value from the video, tap the like button, leave a comment with feedback. Thanks for being here.